Well, this is Tessa. She knows more about textiles than I know about mathematics. So <laughs> listen to her. Good advertising. All right. Thank you so much for having me, Mediuni. Um, I'm really excited to do this talk today. I love to talk about textiles. And um, full disclosure, I did drop out of my textiles degree. So um, I may not be fully qualified, but I did work in the fashion and textiles industry for the last few years. So I think that makes up for it. Um, so when you think of textiles, generally the first image that comes to mind is fabric in some form. It could be curtains or bedspreads or the clothing that you're wearing. If we're being specific though, textiles are any kind of material which is made of fibers, thin threads or filaments that are natural or manufactured or a combination of both. It's an incredibly broad category which surrounds us in our daily life and in a vast number of forms and materials. Many of these materials you will likely already know and they can be categorized into these main types. So I've just got a little table here. I won't go through all of them just so you can have a look at the sort of um, variety there is. Um, the main categories are protein fibers, which is like animal hair and wool um, and cellulose. types of plants really. Um, synthetic, which is a range of different polymers and natural synthetic, which sounds like uh, it doesn't make sense, but I'll explain that in the next section. There are a few other specialized categories, which include metal and asbestos, but that's for another time. Today, I'm gonna to talk about two examples of textile materials, which are quite extraordinary and also unexpected. The first example is a potential solution to one of the commercial textile industry's biggest sustainability issues. And the other is a project which is unbelievably impractical, prohibitively expensive, and took four years to produce a single garment. So, if you'll come along. That sounds like more our style. <laughs> the um, slow, expensive route. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So um, commercial textiles biggest innovation was the invention of synthetic fiber. This took place in 1935 when DuPont, a business in the United States created nylon, which is the fiber responsible for hosiery, parachutes and a thousand things in between. This process involved taking petroleum derived polymers and extruding them into a, an extremely fine strand of fiber, which were then turned into various other products. At the bottom of the slide here, I've got a diagram, which I felt um, shows this process in its entirety uh, best. Um, the polymers are a kind of liquid at first. They're put through um, a spinneret in like a solvent bath. And then there's a process of uh, stretching and washing and finishing, which is usually like heat um, to give it a sort of um, either a smooth and a lustrous finish or something rougher and more robust, um, depending on what application it's going to take. Um, this was revolutionary for the industry as it was cheap to produce and essentially an instant fiber. You didn't need a sheep or a crop um, to get what you needed. It also spelled environmental disaster but the people of the late 30s and early 40s were less concerned with conservation and more with an immediate source of material for war-related applications. Um, DuPont quickly pivoted to creating parachutes um, during the war rather than uh, women's stockings. The introduction of other polymer-derived textile products such as polyester, acrylic, spandex, and many others which utilise the same spinneret technology were patented in the years following. So we also, um, around the same time, we were able to use this technology to create natural synthetics. Um, and so to describe these um, is sort of similar to creating paper from trees. Um, we essentially pulp down a raw cellulose material um, like bamboo or rayon or viscose. Rayon and viscose are like kind of wood pulp or wood chip products. Um, and once they're sort of liquefied or pulped, they're able to be extruded in a very similar fashion. 
So yeah, while these are like uh, marketed as natural materials and biodegradable, and they are biodegradable, there's actually a quite a hefty process involved in making them that has like quite a few um, uh, environmental issues associated. Um, so yeah, that's a pretty pretty big deal for textiles having this like technology, and we've been able to apply it and adapt it for like so many different things it's quite extraordinary um the only problem with it is that every single synthetic fiber we have ever produced is still in existence today so um, we are 88 years on from dupont's initial nylon invention uh and whether these fibers still exist as an original product that is still being used um or they've been recirculated as a recycled product or they are simply sitting in landfill, and a lot of them are. Um, in addition to this, the polymer materials themselves are derived from fossil fuels, and the manufacturing process, as you've just seen, involves a lot of chemical solvents, which contribute to environmental runoff issues. There's a really great program I can recommend um, by ABC in Australia. Um, their Four Corners program did an episode on viscose factories, um, I think they focused on ones in India, but um, it, it was quite um, sensational at the time when they put it out and it had a really good deep dive um, into some of the consequences of producing these fabrics. Um, where was I at? Yeah, so the polymer materials themselves are derived from fossil fuels. Manufacturing process involves a lot of solvents which contribute to environmental runoff. We have perfected a range of natural synthetic fibers, which I just went over. Uh, and while their end product is biodegradable, the chemical process of creating them is significant. So yeah, that's pretty not good. Are there any questions so far about? Yeah, I mean, obviously the chemical runoff part is not good, but uh, okay, the earth is very big. You can dig very big holes. Uh, why do I care if there's mm -hmm. a big pile of synthetic fibers somewhere underground? I mean, if it's leaking into the environment through microplastics, I guess I care, but. Yeah, so microplastics is probably one of the biggest, um, biggest consequences. Um, is part of the argument that it's, I mean, I guess if the source is a non-renewable resource like uh, fossil fuel, then it's, I, I guess it just seems kind of pointless to make it and then bury it uh, by the uh, thousands of tons. Um, mm. Mm. Do you care less because the landfill isn't in your backyard perhaps? Is it um, like, I don't, I haven't done the research on like what the size of the landfill is. I know it's like extremely significant in developing countries. A lot of countries like um, Australia and America um, and in Europe, they tend to ship their textile waste off to places right. like India and parts of Asia. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I know that like, for example, some of the landfill sites um, in these developing countries uh, have like permanently altered the state of the environment around them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, whether it's happening in our backyard or whether it's happening somewhere else, it's probably not a good thing. I guess like the fact is, is that these landfills aren't really going anywhere. Like these textiles are likely unable to be recycled. Um, they don't meet the criteria because recycling, um, sorry, I didn't actually read this slide. Recycling polymer based fibers is um, not really something that has been done a lot. We're seeing it a little bit more, more recently because the consumer demand is there for it. People want to wear things that are recycled because it sort of makes them feel a bit better. But the reality of recycling um, textiles, whether it's natural or synthetic, is that it's extremely costly and resource intensive. Mm. Um, and in the grand scheme of things, it only prevents like a very small amount of the actual textile waste from ending up in the landfill. Yeah. Um, so really like moving forward as consumers and like as like textile producers, we need to sort of uh, find ways to steer away from uh, what we've got. There's not really a way to like change what's already there, um, mm -hmm. I guess, right now. Um, yeah, the, the microplastic thing is like pretty crazy. Whether it's in landfill and they're like sort of uh, affecting the environment in landfill is one thing, but even just having them in our own closets and washing them in our like washing machines at home um that is all the time creating more mi microplastics in the water supply and, um, um we are we finding are more and more, more people, people who, who have microplastics in their bodies and 
that could be from ingestion and that could even be just from wearing um, clothes. I, I had, don't like know the, all the research on it, but it's like quite concerning. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's also completely unavoidable. And so um, it can be quite a depressing topic because you think, oh, this is terrible. What can we do? And it's like, oh, even if you wore all natural fibers for the rest of your days, um, I don't know what a, what sort of impact it's going to have other than on your like sort of uh, conscience, <laughs> I suppose. Hmm. Um, yeah, a little bit depresso. Um, so the answer or <laughs> a partial answer is cows or more specifically cow's milk, which I was a little bit clickbaity and I left it off the initial slide table. Um, cow's milk is rich in protein and produces a really soft and versatile fiber when it's processed. Um, the cow's milk should have been on the table because we have been able to extract milk protein fiber for textile use since the 1930s. Um, this is not a, a new concept, um, but the process used a very, very similar uh, to natural synthetic textiles and it had the same sort of drawbacks with like intensive resources and solvents and stuff like that. Um, what is new and exciting is that there's a German company um, called Q-Milk uh, that was founded by Anke Damasca and she is a microbiologist and fashion designer. <laughs> um, so in 2014, she was researching chemically untreated clothing and she came across this concept, uh, was really like enamored with it, probably because she's German. They love milk, you know. Um, we just moved to the Netherlands and they just go crazy for dairy here. Um, Damasca used about 200 euros of supermarket ingredients and basic laboratory equipment. So she had a lab, but this started in her kitchen, essentially. Um, and she used approximately 3,000 iterations of a recipe to extract milk casein without solvents. Um, and it was successful. So because this is still a very recent development um, in the scheme of things, th the actual process is still an industry secret. Um, but it has been scaled to divert, you know, millions of tons of milk waste annually in Germany alone. And it has really exciting potential to replace a lot of synthetic and natural synthetic materials in fashion applications and more. Um, so that the milk that they're using for this is not uh, edible. It's like um, basically not, not fit for food consumption. Um, so it's a byproduct and it's usually disposed of at a very high cost for dairy producers. So this is a solution for more than just the textiles industry. It's also helping to like combat food waste um, in that regard. So um, there are some pretty cool properties with milk fiber. Um, it can be similar to a lot of natural fibers. Um, it's really good for moisture wicking. It's very lustrous. So usually... Um, to get a sort of lustrous finish on fabrics, we would blend in a lot of uh, natural synthetics like viscose or like rayon. Um, and it's amazing to have an alternative to those fibers, which um, could create uh, a fully uh, environmentally friendly and biodegradable material. So um, say you're blending with cotton, like I've got um, in the slide over here. Am I moving? I'm in the wrong thing. So what does lustrous mean for a material? Just shiny, like silk? Or... Yeah, it's like a shiny, silky finish. I see. Uh, mm -hmm. Cotton on its own uh, is not generally that sort of... A handle is uh, how we describe the feel of a fabric. <laughs> so uh, cotton on its own doesn't generally have a sort of lustrous handle. Um, but if we blend it with something like viscose, we can get a kind of smooth... Uh, shiny finish um, and so instead of using viscose if we can use something like milk um, that it, that fabric and that end result has a, has a much um, kinder footprint um, in the scheme of things so uh, yeah blending natural fibers with synthetics and natural synthetics is done to achieve certain textures and finishes um, there's also some pretty cool properties with milk fiber that make it hypoallergenic and antibacterial when uh, Anka Damasco was actually researching this, uh, she was doing it for her stepfather who was going through chemotherapy at the time. Um, and so we've been able to understand that there are some like very cool um, properties of the fabric um, that are antibacterial, 
And because of this, um, and because this is essentially like a protein or a polymer, um, Q-Milk has a lot more applications than simply just textiles. Um, I've written some down here. So yeah, uh, they have advertised it uh, as being applicable to hygiene products, uh, food packaging, and even building materials. Um, Damasca has a goal to build a house out of Q-Milk um, because essentially if it's a polymer, <laughs> you can sort of create anything with it. In the forest. Uh, which is pretty cool. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I... I haven't been able to find a lot online about that. I didn't go too deep into it, but they have a very comprehensive website um, and there's been a lot of different articles written by it. It was, it was quite sensational, um, this technology, when it was created. So, yeah, thanks, cows. I'm curious. And thanks, Anka. I mean, one can produce cow, the protein in milk, without cows. Uh, precision fermentation <laughs> would do that. So I guess presumably yes. you could then just plug that in and produce this material without the cows. That's right. So the the um, with the process still being kind of uh, under wraps, it's kind of untold yet what sort of adaptations could be made to it to sort of be used for any because it's essentially any sort of protein rich uh, thing has the potential to to be like adapted to fit with this. Um, I'm really interested to know like what other like milks might produce what sort of text styles and like uh what you know any other type of um thing i think it's a i think it's a heat like a thermo sort of process i think they powder the milk and then they sort of do something to extrude it but i haven't been able to find out um fully it's a little bit secret squirrel still um but it's pretty cool it's really it's exciting really so um so new so recently um until now a lot of things have been just kind of like uh using the same existing technology and just sort of trying new, putting new things through the same, the same process, process rather than uh, altering the process altogether. It's funny that- Do you think one of the, oh, no, I, I was gonna say, do you think one of the secrets could be like a nasty byproduct that they don't wanna admit? I don't think so. They've been, like, I, I have approached this uh, with many grains of salt because I am pretty aware of like the marketing and the greenwashing that kind of takes place, especially in the textile industry, because inherently it's quite an unfriendly industry, like environmentally, but um, they've made some pretty bold claims. They have made the claim that there uh, is zero solvent involved, uh, like chemical processing. Uh, and they've made the claim that there is next to no water as well. Um, they, I've seen some warnings with it uh, about washing and that it's uh, also really easy to blend with other fibers due to its like thermal properties. And so I think that their claims are true. Um, maybe the product isn't as like versatile as they might want it to be just yet. Like, I don't know if you can like accidentally melt it at a certain temperature or if you, <laughs> you know, can't blend it with certain things yet. Um, but it is like a commercially available, like this fabric, you can buy it in a, in a shop um today and um i'm sure i've seen like food packaging being used as well so i don't think there's any like nasty secrets um i'll be kind of surprised at this point if something comes up <laughs> so yeah cool um did you have a question dan well, i was just going to remark that it's, it seemed really weird to make uh, material from milk but then of course it's also very bizarre to make material from worms and that seems normal so <laughs> yeah we'll get into that because i think like a lot of people um tend to when they think of silk like i think it's one of those things that you just try to forget about <laughs> that, that there um there are thousands of insects being killed to like create your um so when i worked in um furniture sales uh, i used to get a lot of people sort of forgetting that leather couches were made from like the skin of a <laughs> creature and i'd like talk about how you know you've got to cleanse it and you've got to moisturize it because it is skin and that would like really weird some people <laughs> um, so yeah uh that's a good segue into our next example so i'm gonna go over to this slide um, I've put the properties for silkworms up on this board just because I think that's what is most familiar to um, the average person. And uh, we're going to talk mostly about spider silk um, 
which people may not be as familiar with or they might think it's like similar to worms so just here to dispel any uh, misconceptions so the second textile uh, that we're going to talk about today isn't a new concept we have been attempting to create items with it as early as the 17th century but there are only two complete textiles of their kind in existence today these two textiles took almost four years of continuous work a team of hundreds of skilled workers 500,000 US dollars and 1.2 million golden orb spiders. <laughs> so this project begins with Simon Piers. He was a textile export expert who lives and works in Madagascar. So in 2005, um, Piers was inspired by the French Jesuit missionary and arachnologist Jacob Paul uh, Cambouet. Uh, he worked with spiders in Madagascar during the 1880s and the 1890s. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, Cambouet built a small hand-driven machine to extract silk from up to 24 spiders at once without harming them. So Father Cambouet also had a partner in designing his machine, um, M. Nuge or Nogue. I'm not very good with the French. Today they got quite... Together, they got quite a spider silk industry going in Madagascar and even exhibited a complete set of bed hangings at the Paris Exposition of 1898. Why? Why, why are they making anything with spider silk? Uh, I think that that actually is like the theme of this topic is not like, can you, but should you? <laughs> <laughs> it's very... It's, I think it was seen as like obviously quite uh, rare and exotic and sure. uh, people just get fixated. I think it was one of those things where it was like, wow, I could do this. So like, I'm going to. Um, if you come along, don't fall into the portal for Tasmania. If you come along to this slide, how like uh, insane this is. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> uh, the fabric that they created for the exposition well, wait, was, has been lost. You said that time. didn't harm the spider, I, right? That doesn't look no, quite no. So true. <laughs> this, uh, I'm going to read you an excerpt from the uh, exposition where they showed their bed hangings. We don't have any details on how big the bed hangings were, what sort of material it was that they were able to create. It's all very like here's a uh, here's an extract from a, a news report at the time sort of thing uh i'm going to begin the quote uh it should be said that the female halabe spider allows herself to be relieved of her silken store with exemplary docility and in this and this in spite of the fact that she is distinguished for her ferocity her usual treatment of the males who pay her court is to eat them and she feasts without compunction on members of her own sex weaker than herself the apparatus consists of a sort of stocks arranged to pin down on their backs a dozen spiders. These spiders accept this imprisonment with resignation and lie perfectly quiet while the silken thread issuing from their bodies is rapidly wound onto a reel by means of a cleverly devised machine worked by hand, end quote. So, yeah, they pretty much put the spider in stocks <laughs> and... Um, uh, spin the silk off of them this way so the machine that they ultimately were using was sort of like this but with the ability to harvest silk from 24 spiders so I, I really um, you can't find a diagram for that one in the public domain um, but you can just imagine how like crazy um, this is <laughs> um. yeah I would not have believed that if, well maybe I still don't believe it but it's <laughs> No, it's interesting though because um, this this uh, um, thing they came up with is actually the standard, and sort of a version of this is used by scientists today. Um, I don't think the like mini stocks oh, are involved. I think they sort of restrain them slightly differently, um, but it's pretty much yeah, uh, they Ooh. nailed it. I'm pretty sure I saw Tessa make this image with Dolly. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Well, when she said when she said there wasn't a picture of it being done to 24 spiders at once, that was my, my I wrote down the plan <laughs> for after this seminar. <laughs> um, 
Um, hang on a second. Okay, so it's interesting because the history of spider silk harvesting for textiles has been conducted overwhelmingly by French colonials who had an obsession with producing it as an alternative to silk, uh, to the silk of the Bombyx moth larvae, which produced the material we know and use today. There is an amusing story of King Louis XIV being presented with a spider silk garment which tore in every direction once it was being worn. Uh, that humiliated the king. I'm not sure what consequences befell the spiders or the artisans who produced it. Thankfully, Simon Piers teamed up with the fashion expert, Nicholas Godley, and dozens of highly skilled Madagascan weavers, embroiderers, and seamstresses to complete the project. So if we want to run back quickly to this slide... a little bit about um, the difference between silk and spiders. So there, with a silkworm, you get a lot more silk um, out of the insect than you do from a spider at a time. Um, you only get one lot of silk out of a worm because once they produce their cocoon, they're sort of instantly steamed and killed um, because you do not want the silk strand, which is one continuous strand that creates the cocoon, to be broken. Um, because once the worm has finished um, cooking in the cocoon, I don't know the word for it, they chew their way out, which obviously breaks the continuous strand around them. Um, I sort of am hesitant to say that you get more silk from worms than spiders altogether, though, because they are able to uh, harvest the spiders like more than once. So I suppose over a period of time, you probably get more silk overall from a spider. Um, but... The caveat to that is that uh, the strand of worm silk is 0.07 millimetres in diameter, uh, approximately. But for a spider, it can be as fine as 0.0002 millimetres. So it's quite an extreme difference uh, in like the size of the silk um, as well. We often hear things about how spider silk is like so much stronger and um, a lot more flexible. Um, and that is true, um, but with the fineness of it, it sort of limits the applications a little bit more. Um, you have to scale up uh, any kind of uh, project to, to create a textile like massively, and I'll describe that um, in this project soon. Um, it's getting nicer when the silk is thinner, like a like high thread count or something. Thinner and high thread count are different, but... Um, I don't know how to describe how thin this would be. I can't picture it because I've seen very, very fine silk. Like you could read a newspaper through it. And so I, knowing the difference with spiders, I just can't actually imagine <laughs> whether it would just be transparent. I, I'll come back to this um, because I, I have a pretty good um, way to describe it. Um, if you come to this um, so to make a textile of any significant size, the silk experts had to drastically scale up their project. So 70 people uh, set out every single day over four years and collected over a million golden orb spiders from telephone poles in Madagascar, um, while another dozen workers carefully extracted about 40 to 50 metres of silk filament from each of the arachnids using replicas of Cambuay's <coughs> harvesting device um they uh, nicholas godley and um uh simon Piers have described the difficulty they had in finding artisans who were willing to work with spiders at all um <laughs> which i thought was pretty funny um once they've been harvested of their silk they were released back into the wild where Godley said that it takes them about a week to regenerate their silk. So they say, we can go back and re-silk the same spiders. Um, it's like the gift that never stops giving. End quote. The main reason that the spiders need to be caught and harvested in small batches at a time is because they will immediately destroy each other if kept in captivity together. So uh, it was a very constant process of going out and uh, catching spiders. I think they had schoolgirls bringing up to like 80 spiders at a time in baskets Um every day so it's uh quite like crazy um the final result of this uh undertaking is this exquisite hand woven and hand embroidered cape to give you an idea of how the spider silk was spun into a fabric 
Understand that it takes 24 individual filaments of spider silk to create one thread and 96 threads need to be plied together to create a single strand of silk, which can be woven or embroidered with. So it's quite an incredible scale. Um, and you can just see like how it's taken so long um, to create the, the fiber the um, that we amazing. can actually do anything with. Yeah, so that's actually undyed. That's the color of the golden orb spider silk. Let's turn this baby monitor down. And um, the cape measures 335 centimeters by 121 centimeters, and it cost Piers and Godley approximately 500,000 US dollars of their own money. So it was exhibited at the VNA Museum upon completion, and it is the only complete piece made of 100% spider silk in existence today. I think there was a shawl that went with this. Um, I haven't been able to find a photo of it. Um, so they made a cape and a shawl <clears throat> um, for their exhibit. Um, and I'm not sure, I couldn't find uh, if this is still being exhibited anywhere in the world today, or perhaps it's just in their like own private collection now. Um, but it's quite amazing. In, in a video, they discuss that it's like nothing they've ever felt before. And it's like, um, you know, you can just feel um, the handle of it is uh, so unique and etc. cetera. Um, I don't know. I would love to be able to touch it, but I also think that if I had spent $500,000 of my own money, I would like want to believe that it was incredible <laughs> as well. Every, every um, billionaire should have one. But what's what, yeah, yeah. what determines whether textiles actually last over time? I mean, who's to say this doesn't fall apart in two years? How would you know ahead of time? I think like a pretty good indicator is that like silk garments don't tend to fall apart if they're stored correctly. Uh, like we have, um, we have garments from like Chinese dynasties that you would never have thought would like remain. Um, I don't know if they were like stored, like obviously they've been stored carefully um, over time. I think like it's, it's a pretty good indicator that we understand the properties of spider silk quite thoroughly um, when they're not like spun into a textile. And the good thing is um, spinning fibers. Um, so I talked about um, putting 24 filaments of spider silk into a thread, 96 threads into a strand. That only strengthens a fiber um, as well. So that the, I have no doubt this will probably last for a very, very long time. And I, I'm, mm. I have no doubt that it will probably be stored carefully as well, given the value of it. Um, so, so yeah, maybe it will pop up again someday. I would love to see it. Um, but yeah, it's pretty wild, uh, pretty crazy. It, it is a very like, wow, why would you do this? And I'd love to know like the process behind like designing this garment and like, how did they decide to do this with that of all things? And you know, not a dress or a skirt. It's like quite interesting. The, if you can go online and look at other photos of it, it's actually been embroidered with golden orb spiders. So it's covered <laughs> in spiders. It's very decorative. Um, it's quite, um, it's quite lovely. So, yeah. Um, um, imagine you'd be like to just like cut random bits off like you would if you're like designing any other garment, like you kind of want to use every like, of it. Yeah. Like, yeah. In the video where they're making it, there's uh, a sort of progress shot where they're sort of cutting out the outside seam here to uh, line it. And just seeing any kind of off cut sort of like hurts my heart. <laughs> you, know, you must imagine how the um, artisans would feel after spinning and collecting and harvesting for years and years <laughs> and then having to like cut away some part of the fabric. Um, it, yeah, if I ever have like an expensive fabric that I'm making something with, it's very hard to cut into it. And so I have no idea how these people must have felt uh, with, with Is something like this. Is it usually made in like a, a, can you make it in a perfect rectangle or is it kind of more rough edges like or a weird shape? Um, if, if you're, this was woven by hand and um, the edges of a fabric are called selvages. Usually the selvage uh, has a sort of slightly warped or wobbly or different weave on the ends so that it um, doesn't fall apart. And so you'd have to at least cut the selvages off. Um, at the very can you, least. But, can you recycle that? I don't know. I don't know uh, a lot about the spider silk recycling process. 
unfortunately, there's not a lot on that, <laughs> given that this is the only thing. <laughs> That's a growth industry. Um, I think there, yeah, I think there's there are some like um, so like the two main properties which can continue to set spider silk apart from silkworm silk is that it's extremely fine and that it, it's also antimicrobial. So uh, spider silk is ideal for medical and surgical applications because it's very fine and because um, it like rejects any sort of bacterial growth. Um, so like there is a lot of research being done on it. It's just not like as frivolous as this. Um, I think we'll see it uh, in a few new applications. The other thing is that um, in recent years, there are a pretty cool number of processes which they've been able to apply to silkworm silk which improve its tensile strength and its flexibility to be even greater than spider silk. So we've be, been able to replicate um, some of the properties of spider silk on <coughs> silk. Um, So it kind of makes the need to harvest spider silk for different purposes <laughs> a bit obsolete, really. Wait, wait, wait. Um, wait which wait. is probably a good thing. It was never, it was never uh, not obsolete, right? Clearly the reason to do this was somehow like, I don't know... Uh, not motivated by its end properties, but rather by no. Maybe they just fell in love with the yeah, color of like, the spider silk or something. Yeah, like it, it is a very like um, like I'm glad that uh, Godly and Peters like achieved their vision. Um, I'm really glad that I'm glad that this exists. Just as like a textile enthusiast, I think it's like quite amazing. But it does beg the question why and. I defend a lot of like avant-garde fashion and I defend a lot of different projects uh, just as art. Um, and this has been so much fun to research and sort of learn about, but it is just like, why on earth would you do well, yeah, if, <laughs> Why if, if For this audience, yeah. uh, this, this desire doesn't need much motivation. Of course, this spider silk yeah. cape is <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. every, every mathematician yeah. spends their life producing their own <laughs> spider silk cape. <laughs> Yeah, I like, you know, like this isn't on exhibition anywhere. And so I do have to wonder like what home it's found and whether it's with someone that does wear it just around the house, like in their like mansion <laughs> or something. Um, that's kind of fun to think about. Mm. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I hope that this talk has given you like a really small glimpse into some of the interesting ways that we've adapted and experimented with materials for different purposes. One as an answer to an ongoing environmental disaster and one as a kind of homage to centuries of attempts to spin spider silk. Um, as a consumer, it can be really empowering to understand the properties of different textiles and their environmental impact um, because that allows you to make the most informed choice on a product and it also helps you to distinguish what is best for a purpose. Um, I really encourage anyone to look closely at the tags of your clothing sometime. Generally, a composition tag will be on the left-hand seam of a garment or a t-shirt or your pants. Um, so did you know what they were made of or do you know what will become of it at the end of its life cycle? Uh, what will you purchase to replace it? These are all questions which we can ask ourselves to improve our ecological footprint and to also live more purposefully. Um, so yeah, I've also um, got on this board a few other experimentation with textile materials that I, I've just come across. Um, there's a few using like, if you, if you know kombucha, um, there's like a scoby, a little fermented sort of puck of bacteria that sits in the uh, liquid. My mother uh, makes heaps and heaps one. of kombucha. There's bottles and bottles of it yeah. around me right now. Yeah, I'm sure she has a lot of scobies. Yeah. So tell her that um, there is some textile options for them. <laughs> uh, okay. That has been really cool. I don't think they've been able to make them waterproof yet. Uh, th there have been a lot of garments being made, but they can't be wet or worn for very long because the mo moisture from your body will deteriorate them. <laughs> <laughs> so th that's kind of why like the two the two uh examples that i picked today uh have been like very successful there are a lot of um cool experiments that have been done with textiles which haven't really gotten so far just yet um just because, due to the nature of the material and, and the technology that we've been able to sort of harness with them um but I do encourage like people to look it up. Um, there's some really cool stuff done with seaweed and algae, especially in like the medical industry, um, sort of sutures and dressings and uh, things that uh, are like really crazy and um, have really uh, improved like 
burns treatments and mm. um, things like that. Um, also different ways that uh, different animals that we create textiles from, like their fibers and their hairs, or um, I remember telling Will Troiani that we make a yarn out of possum fiber and just blew his mind. So there's, there's a lot of cool stuff out there um, and learning all of this only improves your knowledge um, like as a consumer. Like again, it's really, um, it can be really great to have the knowledge behind you, even if you aren't super interested in textiles makes it really easy to go shopping um, and wear the right things for the things that you do in your life as well.